Church, would you stand up with me? Welcome. If you're watching online with us, Church Online, we're so glad that you're with us. I'm just curious, is there anyone here who knows my Jesus? Do you know him? Who is the one that we come to worship today? Jesus. Who is our King of Kings? Jesus. Jesus. Who is our Lord of Lords? Jesus. Who is our victor? Jesus. Who gets all of the glory? He is my Jesus, and I pray he is your Jesus too. And today, who do we sing to? Jesus. Who do we sing about? Jesus. Who do we worship? Jesus. Jesus, we give you all the glory yes. today. Be praised in this house. Be praised in your house watching online. We praise today. You are our Jesus. Come on, let's worship our King today. We're going to sing about the God that we serve. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all You would take my place. 
that he's given us. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy of it all. Our worthy, worthy King. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Lord, we thank you for where you've brought us. Thank you, Jesus. you far you know where you've come from and it's because God met you right where you were and he said I'm bringing you out of Egypt take me by the hand while I march you into freedom while I march you into what he has for us thank you God that you don't leave us where we are that by your mercy your grace Lord God that's new every morning we can rejoice we can declare that you brought us out of it thank you God you stepped into my Let's worship him today. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's worship him for where he's brought us from. You stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand. You marched me out.
God, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, as we focus on who you are and what you've done for us, Lord God, we just thank you that, God, that gives us a picture into who we are. That, God, we don't have to be moved by our circumstances or what things look like. But, God, we can look to you. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, we worship you, Lord. May our worship be acceptable to you. God, may you just flow in this place. God, we just worship you. We give you our all. We give you our all, God, and I just ask that it would be a sweet, sweet sound to you. God, we lay everything down because it is all for you. And so God, we worship you that you've created us in your image and in your likeness, God. Thank you. God, we don't have to take on what things look like or feel like. We can be reminded of what you call us to be, what you've created us to be, God. church as I was studying and preparing for our time together I was just amazed at all of the ways God tells us in his word who we are that he shows us our identity and our worth in his word so we don't have to be moved by our circumstances by our Egypt by anything by his grace and his mercy the fact that he died for us that means that we have a shot of going to heaven being with him forever. And when we're there, we'll notice and be fully aware of our identity. So we don't have to be worried about what things look like. We know what God says about us. Amen.
understand who we are in him. And when we understand who we are in him and our identity is him, it gives us the freedom to not be waved back and forth by the troubles of this world. Is there anyone who is in need of some freedom today? What, what, can you shout out to me? What are we needing freedom from today? Give me something that we can pray for. Fear, we need freedom from fear. Tell me, sickness, illness, disease, we need freedom from these things. Pain, I didn't hear it. Finance, financial problems, the, the, the troubles of this world that try to overtake us. God, we trust that we are your children. You see these chains that we're allowing to lock us up? You see them. So God, in the name of Jesus, right now, would you break every chain? God, every chain of illness and sickness and pain and disease, in the name of Jesus, would you bring healing to your people? Father God, Specifically, David, heal those kidneys, Father. Heal them. God, in the name of Jesus, break every chain. There are so many with kidney problems in the name of Jesus that you would remove those problems, Father. God, I know there's so many of us with eye issues. In the name of Jesus, that you would restore. You would restore those issues of the eye. Father God, that we would not be locked up in these chains this, this, this stuff that the enemy wants to throw our way in order to stop us from walking as a prince and a princess. God, we ask today in the name of Jesus that you would provide financially. We trust you. We sacrifice for you. We choose to give it to you. And so open the doors, Father. Open them. 
Open the doors where people need jobs. God, you even answered one of those prayers this week. We were praying for someone to get a job, and the next day, the next day, he got that job. So we know you do it. Do it again, Father. Do it again, Lord. God, in the name of Jesus, we break the chain of fear and anxiety and depression. Lord, would you remove it? Would you replace those things, God, with your joy and with your peace and with your confidence? Lord, that we would not be bound, that we would not be making decisions and and stopping. I, I, it's like it's like a it's like the enemy puts a wall in front of us so that we can't get through. God, would you break it down? God, we know it just takes one moment in your presence, one word of your voice, one one whisper from your breath, God, and our lives can be completely changed. And so we trust that today because we know that you are our dad. Our home is in heaven. Lord, if there's anyone that's hearing me who doesn't know that their home is in heaven, Lord, would you, would you convict, would you allow your Holy Spirit to teach that Jesus, that Jesus died for them. Jesus died for us and that his death is enough. So we choose, we choose to be your children today. And oh my goodness, that we get that privilege to say yes to you. Let us never take it for granted. Because we are a child of God. Can we sing it again? Let's sing it out, church. The sun sets free. Hope is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I thank you and we are so privileged to be called your children and we love you in Jesus name amen can you guys give the Lord a round of applause that we get to be his kid thank you Jesus thank you Lord we thank you as you sit down, can you wave hello, give a fist bump, an elbow bump to someone around you today? We're so glad that you're with us. Uh, so at this time, I get the privilege of introducing my hubby, my husband, uh, the love of my life, Kevin Creasel. Uh, Kevin works at Nyack College as the um, assistant director of the doctoral program there. Most of you probably don't know what he does, but he influences a lot of people. And I know that once we get past the technical difficulties that you will be blessed by the word that he's bringing today. All, all that is a fancy way to say that I answer a lot of emails every day and get to hang out with smart people. So um, a militia on a well-kept secret. Um, when whoever's speaking matches their, their color with the worship team, uh, the anointing is extra that day. Um, I guess I confess, I confess that my, my, my connection to God wasn't fully there this week because I was only a shade of green and not the, the, the gray olive color, but thank you, worship team, for, for all you're doing. Um, I'm going to have Anza come on up. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the values you get to say, one of the values we have at our church is um, releasing the next generation into ministry. And so uh, with that in mind and, you know, the fact that um, Angela has proven that uh, the topic we're talking about today 
is something that sees um, probably ahead of me in, in, in a lot of ways. I was like, you know what, this, this, this could work as a, as a tag team, if you will. Angela works in the back, and she's perfectly comfortable with that. God has given her the gifts to uh, be able to stay back there without the spotlight. So she works at our sound booth a lot, and, uh, and when she's not there, things like that happen. So if she would have stayed back there, I wouldn't have had that feedback. So uh, she's great. Our, Angela also is a, uh, one of the leaders in our youth ministry as well, which we'll, we'll unpack a little bit of that later. Um, she's a psychology major, and so uh, and just thank you for helping me out today. Okay. So we're going to give you um, a, a little like pop culture snippet today. We're going to talk about this idea of cancel culture. So in a second, um, Angela's going to give us a definition of that, and we'll sort of unpack uh, how that fits into our lives. Um, but it's this, I don't think I would have heard cancel culture more than maybe three years ago. It was probably five years because I don't pay attention a lot. So uh, it's a newer idea. Um, but before I start, uh, I'm making a few assumptions today, and we're not going to talk about these three things. But for me to assume you know these already would be bad on me. So I'm assuming today this, this truth that I know, that God created you, he created me, he loves you, he loves me. We're not talking about that. But I just need you to know that that's one of my baselines. Uh, God has amazing plans for us, um, and those amazing plans involve us. So they, they are for us, and they include us. Again, not talking about that. I could probably, you could probably find a good message on that. I think Pastor Jordan's done a few. Uh, but that's a baseline for what we're talking about today. And lastly, uh, Jesus, as God's son, came to earth to give us the full picture of God. So we know more about God because of Jesus and what Jesus said. So again, that's my foundation. We're going to build up from there. You're on, kiddo. <laughs> All right. So cancel culture can be defined as a modern form of ostracism where someone is canceled or rejected because they have said or done something that is offensive. So cancel culture appoints ourselves as arbiters of right and wrong, judge and jury. Um, an example, because I, I need to work with examples or I, I lose the, I run off the tracks. Um, so growing up and then as a teacher, uh, one of my go-tos for reading time was Dr. Seuss. Okay, Dr. Seuss recently has become an example of cancel culture. So whether you hear this or not, I'm just going to walk you through an idea so you get what this is. Um, so the idea is that in some of Dr. Seuss's books, the drawings depicted um, a people group, and, then, and some people found those drawings offensive. So again, back in the day before the internet, it would have just ticked a couple people off and nobody would know. But because we have the media we have now, um, those, that group of people who were offended by that like ramped it up. And so within a matter of hours after someone decided that these pictures in Dr. Seuss's books were, I think there were only five or six of them that they found offense to. But within hours okay, of someone being offended with that, um, you could not buy some of these books on eBay. Uh, the, pub the publishers dropped them like that. They canceled okay, these books because a group of people were offended by something in it. Okay? It's, it's an extreme example, yes, but I would like to say it's, it's isolated, it's not. Okay? There's, there's uh, politicians, musical artists, uh, authors, athletes, et cetera, who have done something that offended people, and the people who are offended canceled them. It could be a block, it could be a delete, it could be stop purchasing their thing. So that's this idea uh, of cancel culture. And at the heart of cancel culture, and you'll come in here, is this idea of offense. So offense is negative feelings that are due to someone behaving in a way that is perceived as rude, insulting, or upsetting. Okay. Um, so simply put, you're still, still with me here. I'm throwing some curveballs at her. This, we, we practiced some of this, some of this we didn't, because that's just how we do it. Okay. So simply put, offense is what? This is you. Use the microphone. <laughs> when someone doesn't, when someone texts me K, like just a K with a full stop. Uh, Angela is particular with her texting, okay? Um, she, she offended me at one point. We're going to get to that. I, I get, full disclosure, I get easily offended, and I offend other people easily. So, geez, yeah, you're welcome. Um, but we were texting, uh, probably for a youth thing, and just because of how I was brought up and because of my background in education, 
I punctuate texts. Like, oh, shame on me. But I put, peri I put periods at the end of my texts. And one day, uh, Issa texted me back, and she was like, you know I find it insulting when you put periods at the end of your text. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? Like, that's proper English. I feel like you would appreciate that. And she was like, no, it feels like, it feels like you're, you know, you're I don't. You're mad at me. Yeah, it feels like you're mad at me. And I was like, what? And, um, and that's offense. You know, or if I ask her a question and, and if she asks me a question, I type K, like the letter K, as my answer, that bothers you. Yes. So offense is this idea that, like, something bothers us about somebody. Now, um, we're going to try a short game, okay? Feel free to play along at home. Um, I'm going to say something that I can be offended by, and Andrew's going to try to match, kind of like ping pong. Okay? We're gonna, if we repeat or we can't think of it, we lose. Okay? So I'll start because I'm old. Okay? Um, I can be offended by a text. I can be offended when I'm not invited to a party or something. Okay. I can be offended um, over an email. I can be offended when someone keeps making excuses. Okay. Uh, I can be offended if someone looks at me. I can be offended when someone is late repeatedly. Oh, I, I don't like that either. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, uh, I could be offended by an emoji. I can be offended by a tweet. Ooh, yeah. Um, I can be offended on an athletic field. Like I can sport. be offended at church. Oh, yeah. I could be offended driving. I can be offended. Wait, what? I could be offended while driving. I can be offended at someone's driving. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. The, the idea here is that you can find offense everywhere, anywhere. Okay. Our legal system lays it out in this way. You, know, you have serious offenses in the legal system called felonies, and it works its way down to more common or lesser severe like, like um, violations. And there's punishment accordingly, you know, jail time down to a fine. Okay? Um, I'd like to, you know, for our, our conversation here today, um, the kind of offenses we're talking about, in my mind there's sort of two categories. That top category, um, are very severe, abuse, trauma, severe betrayal, abandonment. Um, those are offenses. Those are done to you, it, it offends you, it hurts you. Um, but then that other pot at the bottom there um, are a lot of words that like, sometimes we associate or may not associate with offense. Uh, hurt, mistreated, insulted, all of those are kind of in a, a bundle. And unfortunately, um, some are more severe than others, but there's no real way to tell. Like, there's, no, there's not a chart I can give you to say, okay, these are the insults, these are the hurts, these are the, like, it, it varies, it's messy, because people are messy. So, but a couple things that distinguish these two categories are this. Um, if, I, if I do one of the top ones to Angina, and, and I'm gonna use her as an example a lot, we have our issues, but this is not one of them. I did not do one of the top ones. But if, if, I, if I do one of those top offenses to her, most likely I know it. It's not like I accidentally would abandon her. Like, if I abandoned her, I would know I'm doing that. If, it's not like I could accidentally abuse her. If I abused her, I would be aware of that. Those bottom ones, not so much. Um, I could do those things and be completely unaware. Like, again, I put a period, because I think I've been having proper English, and, and she reads a different way. Uh, the other main difference is, those big ones, like, they hit hard. Like, like any of those, anyone who's in a room this size with this many people, I guarantee there's people who have that top section. You've been betrayed, you've been abused, you've been abandoned. Um, those are big, you know those have. Those bottom ones, because they're so small, it's almost like the bottom level of those legal ones. Like, if you get a $25 fine for something, it's not nice, but, you know, we could probably find the $25 to pay it. But if I have 20 of those fines, it adds up. That bottom section, those little hurts, those little insults, they add up. And because they're harder to identify, it's like it's easy to, to not know they're there. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 If I don't make sense, you have to, you're my accountability gotcha. today. Gotcha. Okay? Yeah. Um, so this is how I'm thinking about it. Um, this, this is you in the middle. This is me in the middle. We all have a circle. Um, the circle in this, for this conversation are the people in, in our lives consistently. Okay? So it doesn't mean you like them or not. Okay? They're just, those are the people that are in your life. Okay? Outside the circle are people who are not in your life. Okay? 
so the, the concept I'm working with is this. Um, anyone on the page can offend us, okay? The people outside that circle, they're in a different category. So like, we talked about driving. So if I'm driving and I get cut off, that annoys me, it annoys me more than most people. Like, Maria doesn't get nearly as annoyed as me when someone cuts me off and they're entitled and they get, I'll pray about it. Um, but, th but that bothers me. But I'm 99% sure I'm never going to see that person again. Like, they're not in my life. But all these other people, my boss, my neighbor, the person who, who picks up my trash, you know, on, on Wednesday mornings, okay? Um, family members, they're in my life. And so the idea here is that the closer they are to the center, the more offense they, they can potentially give me, okay? So stand up for a second. We didn't practice this one. I'll mask up for you. So um, stand right there. Face that way. OK. Put your arm out. Make a fist. OK. OK. You can't move your feet or your like, hips, but you want to punch me in the arm. OK. Now, you're a little strong. <laughs> OK. Because of where she is, I got the end of her punch. Now, if, if I move, don't do this. <laughs> if I move closer, and she punches the same exact punch, it's going to hurt me more. But I don't want to have, feel pain today, so I'm not going to do that. And, and it works similarly in that circle. The closer people are in that circle, OK? Um, so in, in my circle here, my boss is way up there, and my friend is closer. If they do the exact same thing to me, it's going to hurt more from the person that's. And it's probably going to last longer. And it could last longer, too. Um, the other piece of our circle, our lives, is it's mobile. Like, like uh, it's fluid, maybe that's a better word. So like people move in and out of our circles, like people who move away, um, people who we disassociate with, we grow out of. And so the idea here as we're talking today is in that circle is you, okay, and everybody that is kind of in your life. And so remember that. Again, we're talking about cancel culture. The center of cancel culture is offense. You know who loves cancel culture? El Diablo. Okay, um, Satan loves cancel culture. A few weeks ago, Pastor John, uh, in one of his messages when he was in Nehemiah, was talking about how when you know what the enemy is going to do, whether it's a sport, an opposing team, or a battle in an enemy, when you know what the enemy is going to do, okay, it helps you to fight that, to combat that. I can do the opposite to counteract what he's going to do. So in this case, if the enemy... Um, of our souls, the devil, if he loves offense as his main weapon, it helps us to know that. Um, I, I like the way C.S. Lewis puts it. He's an author from back in the day. Um, he, he talks this way about the devil. He says, um, we do a disservice if we give too much credit to the devil, but we equally do a disservice if we give too little credit to him. So while I don't want to make this about the devil, shame on me if I don't make it somewhat about him. Because one of his biggest tactics, one of the biggest ways he cancels us is through offense. This verse from Ephesians, um, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give the opportunity to the devil. Um, that's simply saying, when I let offense linger, I give the devil an opportunity. We've used the term foothold a lot. Um, I give him ground. I give him permission. Those are synonymous here. So if I let offense linger, any of those things on that chart, those, those words, hurt, uh, insult, if I let those stay, I'm allowing the devil permission to stay in my life. No bueno. Okay? So, so he's a huge fan of cancel culture. Um, so let's look at this. Let's look at what causes us offense. Now, uh, we're going to throw a lot at you. And uh, a lot of these things you can take from a couple different perspectives of... Um, like I offending others, or in this case, I offend Angina, or I could switch it around and take this from she offended me. There's so much crossover there. So um, where do offenses come from? Living, okay? <laughs> like if you have a pulse, you will get offended, Jesus says, okay? Uh, if it hasn't happened yet today, it will, <laughs> okay? Uh, tomorrow's Monday, it certainly will. It's, it's going to come, and in most cases, you can make the argument that there's two kinds of people in life, those who get offended and those who offend. No, not in this case. Um, I know people who never get offended. Like, they, they just, it's so hard to offend them. 
and they're so nice that they don't really offend others. There's a few of them out there, okay? Um, I know some people who are just like wrecking balls, like they just offend others. Like they, they don't get offended a lot, but they just walk through life like, <laughs> like just causing offense. There's people the other way around who just everything offends us. I kind of am in that camp more. And there's people who do both. You know, I offend a lot and I get offended a lot. And so it's a, because it's a messy thing. Um, this is an external thing, okay? I can't really offend myself. I need help, okay? Angela's not going to offend herself. She needs me to do that. <laughs> she needs me to offend her or someone else in her life. And so uh, it's important to remember that. Um, the, the key piece here, and I'll ask your opinion on this in a second, is um, the internal stuff, although I can't offend myself, the stuff within me makes me susceptible to offense. So my soul stuff makes me um, more, I get offended by what my soul stuff is, okay? Um, I never, you can't offend me by telling me I don't run fast. I don't, I don't have an issue with that, okay? You can't offend me by making fun of, you know, how short I am or how I'm overweight because that stuff I've been made fun of my whole life. And so those hit. You say, Kevin, you're slow. I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, it so whatever our soul stuff is, that which is internal, that's where the offenses can hit more. What do you think? Like, you talked about soul stuff a little bit. How does that fit? I, I agree. So if you remember one of the previous slides, you talked about abandonment, rejection, all of those things. I think if you've gone through that when you were younger, you're more likely prone to get offended when someone, if you had a trust, if you were abandoned or rejected, you're more likely to have trust issues with someone. So if they do something to affect yeah. your trust, it's going to hurt you a lot more because of what happened in the past. Same way with the use. If someone said, oh, Kevin, you run really slow, it wouldn't really affect you unless all your life, like you said, you had been teased for being fat or overweight. Yeah. And so you automatically might connect that to the previous experiences that you've had, and that can cause you a, a lot of hurt. Yeah. Um, the, other, the other piece of cosmic offense, which we mentioned with the punch, is um, how close people are in that circle. Okay. Again, their proximity to you um, allows them more hurt. In fact, you had a stand up again. <laughs> uh, you had first COVID shot this week. Okay, so a bit of pretend it's on this arm. Okay, okay I think it was it was this one. It was this. One. It was this one. Okay. So if I if I flick this arm like right here, mm -hmm. it's again it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt, hurt as much. Yeah. If it was the day after your shot and I did the same amount of pressure, it would hurt a lot. Because again, there's a wound there. Yeah. And that's kind of, I feel like that's the visual of what you're saying is like, uh, when I have that, that soul wound, mm -hmm. it just hurts more. So um, what else causes offense? Mean people, okay? Mean people, don't be mean, okay? Mean people stink, okay? But truth be told, if you, if you wrote down all your offenses and lined them up, the majority of them are not going to come from mean people. Because if you had a lot of mean people in your life, you would have moved them out of that circle. Again, some people you can't move out of your circle. Okay, if you have in, my in-laws are great for the record. If you have in-laws that are mean, okay, or grandma that's mean, I love grandma. Uh, but you can't move certain people out of your circle completely. But uh, if you think about who hurts you, who offends you, who insults you, it's usually not just mean jerks on the street. It's usually people in your circle. Okay. Um, the other thing that we, we get offended is when people try to help us, okay? This one's hard for me, so I, because I tend to take things personally. So if I'm working at the grill, and I'm grilling, and somebody comes up to just say, hey, Kevin, you're working at the, you know, like they see me sweating, I'm at the grill, flipping like a boss, and, um, and, uh, and they say, hey, you want me to do that? I don't take that as, oh, they're being helpful. I take that as, you think you're better than me? <laughs> you think you're better than me? And, uh, and that's how I read it, because I'm like, again, my own issues, I'm like, they're just trying to help. I've had this happen at work. Like, like I, I can't tell you a number of times I've, I've had an idea at work, and I bring it to somebody in another department to say, hey, it's just an idea. I'm just throwing it out. Like, I, I'm, I'm relatively, I'm, I'm not overly cocky, like, outwardly. Like, I don't come to them and say, you should do this, you loser. Like, like I kind of come low key and say, hey, here's an idea. You, know, you, you even take the credit for it. And I've actually been told, because, that part, because they have issues like I do, 
me saying that offended them. I've actually been told, stay in your lane, Kevin. Like, uh, even if the idea would have made us money, I, like, they didn't even get past that because you know, I was just trying to help, but they were like, you stay in your lane. Like, you're trying to like, take my sign. You're trying to be in my department. Don't. And I'm like, like but I've done the same thing. You know, like the grill idea. You know, like I, it's happened. Um, one of our, the biggest ways that we get offended is the, the, the concepts of uh, expectations and assumptions. I'm telling you, like, if you can get a handle on this, it'll help every relationship in your life. Um, we have expectations and assumptions. The problem is we don't let other people know. Um, and they have expectations and assumptions, too, that we don't know. Um, I needed to miss a meeting at work, okay? And I, and I typed a not long, but very professional three-line email that just said, hey, for this, this, and this reason, I don't think I can be there on Tuesday. Is that okay? Okay? The email back was no. Nothing else. <laughs> like, not a signature, not a, a sincerely, like, like nothing. And, and I got mad. Um, because I had the expectation that this person would read my reasons and consider them. And when I brought it up to him later and said, listen, it really bothered me that, that I got that. He's like, oh, I was driving, that's why. I was like, well, don't text and drive. But, uh, <laughs> PSA, don't text and drive. Uh, but because I had an assumption of him reading it and understanding, I got offended by that simple answer, which, I, again, you could argue, why would you be offended by that? But again, it's so many things. We have these assumptions and expectations that the rest of the world isn't privy to. Um, the last one on this is, um, and this is hard for me, uh, the idea that sometimes I, I'll, sometimes I will legit do something that offends you, or I will legit do something wrong. But I also, there's times I don't, and someone just thinks I do. Like, like either they didn't bother to check the story, or they didn't ask me like the why, and and it's it's such a it's such a kick in the gut when someone thinks you did something that you didn't do. So that means they're probably offended for something that you don't know about. But then you're offended because they think you did something that you may not have done. I'm getting better where if I actually do the thing, I'll try to own it. But yeah, because I do that a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You have anything on any of these? Sometimes um. Keep going. Okay. Uh, next. So, what else causes offense? Um, hurt people hurt people. Okay. Uh, and like I said, most people are not mean. Okay. Most people are just acting in their own self interest. Like when I do something wrong, it's usually not because I'm out to get you, it's just because I'm more concerned about my stuff. So, like when I'm driving and the guy cuts me off, he's not like, yeah, I got him. He's, he's doing his thing, whatever that is, getting to work, going to see his kid, you know, you gotta go to the bathroom, I don't know. Like, most of us tend to act in our own self-interest, um, but because we don't know that, it looks to us like, so, like, like a fence. Um, how many like, times can you be offended over miscommunication, okay? Like, you know, I mean, the simple stuff, like how many times have you sent a text and you've been like, I wrote that, voice text, I have to voice text a lot because you know, I'm in the car, and I'll, I'll read it after, I'll be like, oh wow, those three words like don't even exist, <laughs> you know, uh, because of miscommunication, you know, or misunderstanding. And, and so many times, like, these little things offend others, okay? Chime in at all? No, I definitely agree, because even going back to what you said of someone telling some, somebody else something, and when it finally gets to you, it's a completely different story. And it can hurt because that might have never been your intention or that might not have been even been the story you told. And I think that's why miscommunication and misunderstanding are very two big influences on of being offended. Huge, yeah. huge. And again, we're throwing all that at you. I think a disclaimer that I'll say is there's a ton about this you know, the, in the Bible and there's books. We, we couldn't possibly, you know, uh, Andrew's a psych major, and we've talked through some of that aspect of this. There's just not time to go through it all. So this is not comprehensive. But one of the biggest reasons we get offended is because we make it about us. 
It's all about you. Okay. Shout out to the Women's Bible Study. Raquel, good book. Um, but for most of us, we're the star of our own movie. Whether we like to say it or not, we, we can act and behave and think as if the world is around us. And every action taken is, is in response to us. You know, no one likes to admit that. I hate when I get told, get over yourself, Kevin. But honestly, 90% of the time when someone says that, I need to hear it. Because when we're the star of our own movie, there's pride involved, there's entitlement. Like, we think we deserve something. And um, as long as we're thinking that, then no matter what other people do, it's going to hit us the wrong way. Okay? Um, the idea that, like, how often do we take something personally when somebody, like, didn't even mean it? You know? Um, the BOD, the benefit of the doubt. Like, there's so, there have been so many times in my work life and church life and home life where I would, I would wish, like, someone would just give me the benefit of the doubt. Like, before you get mad and you go off, like, you know me. Like, like why don't you give me the benefit of the doubt before you get mad? Like, a, a dumb example that I've actually heard more than one person say, like something in the mall. So, like, if we pass each other in the mall and, and I don't say hi to you, I didn't stop to say hi to you, okay? Like, give me the benefit of the doubt. Like, maybe he didn't see me. Maybe he was in a rush. Before jumping to, wow, Kev's a jerk. He just ignored me. But, like, we do that. Like, we process that as a computer in our head so quickly. Like, wait a minute. I, Angela said hi to me at church, but, you know, like, she didn't say hi to this person? Like, what a jerk. You know, like, not that you really <laughs> you know, but, but, but we take things personally that aren't meant to be taken personally. And that can lead to offense. Okay? Um, we spend a lot of time and energy on this. We spend a lot of time and energy being mad at other people, being hurt. And, um, and again, back to why we're talking about this, the devil loves that. Like whenever he can take your eyes off of other stuff and put them on hurt you, he's loving that. Not that hurt you is not a real thing. Hurt you hurts. But there's implications. There's ramifications. Um, there are other like contributors to this. There's physical, environmental, emotional. When we have history with people, the idea of, of holding on to offense. Um, when when Angela hurts me and I'm offended, okay, that gets cataloged in my mind. I don't forget that. So when we interact again a month later, you know, at a youth meeting or two weeks later, you know, after church, that's already in my head. So if something else comes up that I read the wrong way, I add it to that catalog, and it just, I start a book, you know? And we keep these histories of our, our lives with people. And again, that adds to the offense. Um, when we do that, we get defensive more quickly, okay? When I'm offended, I get defensive right away, which we'll talk about some examples of that. Did you have anything about the physical, environmental, uh, emotional? I feel like we already, um, like, went over it. Definitely, if you've already had past experiences, um, if you're in an environment where you're surrounded by people who are more likely to offend you, that's just going to keep piling up, like the circle we talked about. Um, yeah. And, but, but, you, but again, there's, there's a reality that you can't get out of some environments. Right? I yeah. mean, you could, you could say that I can move my job, that yes. I can switch jobs, you know? Some of us can't do that. do that like yeah. that's that's not a reality for some people but you are i feel like there are situations and scenarios where you will not be able to get out of it and you'll feel like your hands are tied uh, but i do think that's something we want to address um, later on as we go because it's there is always a solution and i believe jesus is that <laughs> but we'll talk about that yes so those are the causes what's the impact the, the impact of offense is, is many. Um, again, I'll let you hit the physical, some of the okay. emotional ones. Um, first, I'll do the build-up one. So uh, recently at my job, I had a, we had an email from a student. Um, and when I say, when I'm talking about my students, they're like 55-year-old, you know, grown professionals, not, you know, a 19-year-old. And his, his email started with, I think I need to withdraw from the program. Um, and, he, and he gave a list. And, and the list included, you know, I, I set up a meeting with this person and, and he didn't hear back, I didn't hear back from him. You know, when he, you know, Kevin, like I emailed so-and-so and I didn't hear back from him. And then he listed five other reasons 
and none of them occurred within the last like five years. And it, it got me thinking like, man, like he was still upset about these things that happened like five years ago when he started the program and it's coming up now. And that idea of like build up when it comes to offense, you know, like, like those little things, when you put them all in a pot, like the pot gets heavier. And so, you know, in the, with the, in the student's case, we had to say, like, okay, we're not really gonna talk about them because that's not gonna be useful in this conversation, but knowing that those were there helped us to understand it. Give us some other, uh, the impact. So I'm trying, I'm, I'm gonna start with emotional because I feel like we underestimate the impact of emotional a lot of times, but I'm gonna try to use a similar scenario where I'm a student is in a classroom with a teacher and has anxiety every time because either the teacher does not listen to the questions or passes over the questions or does not grade on time or if they grade, they're not really good with your feedback. I feel like I'm talking from experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so what happens to the student is every time they enter that class or every time they w log on to that class, they're just filled with anxiety. They're filled with frustration, anger, resentment. And um, they might go into that class with thoughts like, oh my God, I hate this teacher. This teacher is so annoying. I wish I wasn't in this class. So all of that is emotionally hurting this person, right? What's gonna happen then as this keeps going on, for example, in your case, it was five years. If this keeps going on one month, two months, this person might start showing signs of physical, the physical impact where it, it might be um, a burnout. They st might start reaching a burnout. They might get, they might feel tired all the time. You know, you can even get ulcers from stress. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what can happen is then, because they're tired all the time, they're exhausted all the time, they get angry. When they get angry, their relationships are impacted. Someone might say something like, hey, did you eat food? And, oh my God, why are you bugging me? Stop bugging me all the time, I will eat. You know, and that's how relationships get impacted. But it was all, it all started with one teacher being mean or rude or offensive in a sense. And this person was not able to deal with that situation. So it built up, it, it caused a build up yeah. and then it had this ripple effect. No, that's, that's good. Um, the, so the, the other version, the, the old person version of that, uh, for those of us not in classrooms, is you know this feeling. Like there's certain people right now that if, if your phone rang and their name showed up, you would have that pit, right? Like, you're like, oh God, why are they calling me? You know, uh, there's certain people that if you walk into a building, whether it's an office or a church and you see them, you get that, oh my God, like that anxiety piece because you know there's something not right and you wish you could hide or they see you and they wish they could hide. Um, so, follow, so offense turns to anger, anger to outrage, outrage to hate. This, this is how you get, this is how you get to a place where you, you hate an entire people group. Like, like the offense builds, and instead of me just being angry at my teacher, I become angry at every teacher I ever interact with. You know, so that's why you get people who now have hate and outrage towards entire professions or entire genders or entire um, people groups because, again, these little offenses build up and you, you haven't taken care of them, you haven't dealt with them. Um, other impacts. Um, offense divides groups that should be together. Whether it's a family, a team, a church, an office, if there's offense, it divides the group, okay? Let's be honest, relationships are hard enough. Like one of the things I've learned in the last year is how hard it is to keep up with friendships and, and it's work. Like if I just sit around and wait for my friends to reach out to me and say how I'm doing, my phone doesn't ring. You know, like I have to work at. Relationships are hard enough, so if you throw a fence into there, you know, like teams are hard enough. Marriages are hard enough. Parent-child is hard enough. If you start getting offended and hold on to it, it just divides those and makes them even harder, um, that whole ripple effect. And again, the big one is this, like when, when we let a fence stay, the biggest impact is the it allows the devil that foothold. It allows him to cancel what we could be. Um, so being easily offended, uh, you can miss out on a lot. And um, I had this opportunity at work. I went to this guy um, with a plan to help him. And uh, 
he was so offensive and he was so offended by me for some other reason and defensive that again he missed this opportunity that probably would have saved his job you know um, but the same thing is with, with Jesus like when I'm offended if, if Angela offends me then I'm, I'm mad at, I'm mad at her you know I'm thinking about the offense I'm thinking about me I'm thinking about everything in the world except Jesus and and that's when the devil's like score because that, if I'm looking at offense, if I'm looking at why I'm mad or how much a jerk that person is or, or how bad they did me wrong or how much they hurt me or what I wish could happen to them, you know, uh, I'm looking at everything but Jesus. And then the devil wins. And so um, what does not Jesus say about offense? Um, what, people say these things. They say, cancel them if you're offended. Build a bridge and get over it. That's, that's my favorite from my friend Gabby. She likes to say that to me. Um, people say forgive and forget. People say, you know, pay back, get back at them. People sing the Frozen song, and they say, just let it go, okay? Um, those are not terrible advice. They're just incomplete. Other ways we've, we've, heard, we've learned to respond, nobody teaches us these, but sometimes when we're offended, we do silent treatment. Um, we ignore them. Um, in college, I majored in English, but I minored in passive-aggressive, so I'm, I'm super skilled at that. Um, so quick story about that. Um, this, this makes my job sound really bad, all these work examples, so uh, hashtag Naya College. Uh, there's a lot of good there, but I was trying to help a student, and so I, was, I helped them via email, and I got this response from somebody that was definitely annoyed. So I said, I'm not going to do this by email because I learned that lesson. So I called the person up, and they were mad. They're not mad at me. They were mad at the situation, but I was on the end of the situation. And I'm telling you, the way they responded, the way they were talking was not okay, not appropriate. I got mad. I dealt with it. Um, a week later, a couple days a week, we had these prayer calls where, because, again, a lot of people are remote. So it, during the lunch hour, we'll get on a prayer call. And I heard his voice. On the prayer call, I heard him pray. I know the voice, and uh, and I was thinking. So, a, I'm not praying. B, I'm not thinking about Jesus. Three, I'm mad. And four, I'm I'm running in my head the prayer I'm about to pray to like put him in his place. Like that's my passive aggressiveness. I'm ready to like, and, and I'm not the only one who's done this. Sometimes we pray for other people to hear, not so much for God to hear. And I'm contriving my prayer of like how I'm going to make him feel bad for, for yelling at me a couple weeks ago. And I, I, I didn't pray it, so that was a small victory. But again, these are the ways we're taught to do it. Um, we had youth a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about friendship. And I asked one of the girls, uh, our daughter Maya, I said, what would, what would you want in a friend? Like, what, would, what would make a good friend in you? And her answer surprised me. It was very wise. She gets that from her mother. Um, she, she said, I wish when my friends were mad, they would say so. And I was like, yeah. Like, why do we, why do we learn silent treatment? Why do we learn to play make-believe and say, like, pretend it's okay? Somewhere along the way, we learn that when you get hurt, these are your go-tos, okay? Jesus gives us a few things about offense, okay? Um, uh, these are some things Jesus says about offense. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come back and offer your gift. Yeah. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. In Romans it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Uh, I want to just kind of boil those down. Um, here's the problem. Um, if you, if you were at our house one night and our kids are home from school and they have friends over, uh, sometimes they'll play a game called Uno. It's a card game, okay? Uno at our house is, is a kind of a, a cross between like Hunger Games and uh, like a Vegas like poker club. Like the Uno deck is now like this big because it's like 17 decks combined. Uh, there's slapping, there's blindfolding, there's all kinds of crazy house rules. Um, and, and with some games like that, whenever you sit down and play with somebody, dominoes the same way, you sit down and play with somebody, you have, to, you have to figure out what are their rules. Spades, you know, like everybody plays these a little differently, okay? The problem with a lot of the Jesus sayings is everybody plays them differently. So for this, what I'm saying is you can't take just one of those passages that we looked at and, and run with it only. You have to take kind of all of what Jesus says into account here, okay? Jesus touches on the idea of the power of us, okay? He, he's not making it about single people, like one person. He's making it about community, okay? And in everything we do, he's saying the heart matters, okay? So that's what, what Ant and I just read. Um, he's pointing out this truth that our relationships with each other are connected with our relationship with him. They're, they can't be looked at independently, okay? Um, Jesus' way is not ours, okay? Well, so when he says, like, you know, love your enemy, he's going contrary to how most of us were brought up. Like, somebody hits you, you hit them back, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, Jesus understood that idea of the circle. Like, he spoke to people differently. And so if he's in the middle of his circle, all the people who are in his circle... You know, some he kept further away. You know, um, he had specific things to say to them. Some things he said specifically to the people close to him. Um, and then the, the last one that I feel like is truth about Jesus is like, there's always room for forgiveness from him. And so if we go back to that baseline we started with, which is, you know, Jesus is showing us the full picture of God, then Jesus shows us forgiveness. So here are some ways you can respond to offense. Um, some of you would be well to practice preventative measures, okay? So preventative measures for, like, physical things are you exercise more. You exercise before you have the heart attack, not after. Um, preventative things to do with offense are this. If I have my eyes on Jesus, I'm less offended, okay? Um, there's this concept, I think, I, I heard it first from Maria, but I've heard it a couple other places since, of being hard to offend. Like, if you live a life where you aren't stone cold, but you just aren't taking everything personally, and it's hard to offend you, okay? That prevents some of this from happening. The idea we talked about, benefit of the doubt. If you give most people in your circle the benefit of the doubt, you save yourself a lot of stress, okay? And then that, that last verse that we read there from Romans, as much as it is from, on you, try to be at peace with everyone in your circle, okay? You brought, you, you brought up a good point about like liking everyone. Like, you don't have to like everyone in your circle, you know, like, but we should be able to be at peace with them. You know, like, you don't have to, again, have fun and, and enjoy all of them the same way, but there should be a way to be at peace with them. Other things you can do when you're offended. Uh, it's like exfoliating, okay? When you let it build up, you need to, you know, scrape that dead skin off, okay? Shout out to Mary Kay Skin Products, okay? But, but... The offense is the same way. It builds up, and every once in a while, you need to exfoliate your soul and say, let me just get rid of all this bitterness and stuff I'm dealing with. Um, when you're offended, take a breath. Before you hit the horn, hit the sand, just take a breath. Like, so many times we respond quickly, whether it's verbally or not. Um, it's just not the best way. Um, do your own soul care work. Like, it's hard, but not as hard as having everybody in your life mad at you and you mad at them. Uh, we're going to walk through a case study um, of 
uh, I'll set the stage, you come in. Yeah, so so uh, you, you said a lot, Kevin talked about perspective. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, talked about perspective a lot. And so in this scenario or in this case study, I'd love to hear your perspective before I go first. Okay. Yeah. So um, I worked with the youth ministry here at the church for about a decade. And um, the last few years, I was in charge of the youth ministry, the student ministries on Friday nights. And I had talked to Pastor John, and our plan was to transition from me to the current leader, who is Sean, doing a great job. Um, and so as part of my team, two years ago, Angela came on board. Like, we saw a lot of potential in her. I, I reached out to her and said, we'd be part of this team. She prayed about it and said yes. Um, this time last year was a year ago, I realized, because it was with COVID, we had to do the meeting online. Um, so a year ago is when we decided to make the transition. I was going to step to the side and be a help, and Sean was going to step in and take over this ministry. And so because of COVID, we had to do this on Zoom. So I had a Zoom meeting where I told the team, this is the transition. I had hinted about it, but I had never come out and said it. And I wanted them to know before the parents and the students knew. And so I told them, I said, listen, you know, we're excited about this. We prayed about it. This will be my change into this role, and Sean will be doing this. And again, there were, I, I cried a little bit. I, you know, they cried a little bit. Like, it was a, it was a moment. Um, and that's how I saw it. Like, I was excited thinking, okay, like, the next generation is going to come up and take over this ministry. And Sean, again, is a, is a good man for it. And what did you hear? Like, what were you seeing in that meeting? Like, give me your side of that. Just what I saw in the meeting? Well, no, just like at that stage, what are you, what's running in your head? Oh, um, I was angry because I was yeah. like, this guy didn't tell me and he's just leaving. Um, so I think for me at that moment was the key word was he's leaving. And for me, I said like, oh, he's leaving me behind or, you know, I'm getting left behind. I was not informed of this. And if I were to give my perspective just to say why this was my thought was growing up, I had a lot of negative experiences with church leaders and just people in my life, authority, um, relatives. I, I was not, I had a lot of trauma, a lot of broken trust, betrayal, abandonment, reject, rejecting that I have been working on with soul care. And so Kevin was the first person when I came to this church who talked to me and he was also the first person who saw this potential in me and was willing to work with me at my pace. So, um, I was able to finally trust a leader and, and, and like have a mentor. We all know how great it is to have a mentor you can lean on. And so Kevin became that mentor I could lean on. And um, he, we also worked, he, he also works with me uh, on other parts of ministry. And so when this transition came, I was not aware of it in a sense. I know he said he hinted at it, but it didn't really hit my mind that he was leaving. And so on that Zoom call, when he said he was leaving, for me, it's just all these past memories just came blaring to the front. And that's how we talked about how Satan has a foothold, because the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, he's leaving, and he's leaving you behind. You shouldn't have trusted. What did I tell you? And it wasn't Kevin's fault. It wasn't anything he did. Um, it was just me with my own soul care stuff. I think as you work, on your soul care, God reveals more and more. And I think that was a moment of revelation for me. And do you want to talk about how I responded to it? Yeah. So uh, again, it's such a, it, for me, it's such a sad but perfect example of like, it's an announcement. I'm, I'm a little sad on the announcement, but really 90% of me in that announcement was excited. Like I'm, as a leader, I'm looking ahead and I'm like, what's God going to do? And, and how unaware I was at that moment of someone on my team who matters like how that hit them. And again, for me, like, that's one of the reasons I'm asking her up here today is because of the way she handled this, you know? Like I could think of 12 bad ways to handle it that I probably would have done 11 of them, you know? Um, and, and I could tell, like, like whenever we had to interact next about like youth stuff, I could tell she was a little, can I say cold? I think that's right. Uh, cold. Was serious? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> she was a little more serious. And, and I knew something was off. I wasn't exactly sure. Um, and I think I, I, I think I gave you space and I said, can we talk? Yeah. And, you, and you had an interesting response. You remember what you said? Mm -hmm. Okay. She was like, not yet. Which, which A, I hate, because I like to get things like, I like to get it smooth and move on. Uh, but I respected that. Mm 
And so what she did is um, she did some assessment. Like she kind of figured out, you know, like why am I so upset at this, which is valuable to do. Um, she gave me the benefit of the doubt in this, which I appreciate. Like she knew Kevin's not doing this to hurt me. Like, and, and, I'm, and I don't mean disrespect here. Like, in a sense, she was making it about her. Mm -hmm. and, and she's strong enough to admit that. And, and because of that, that's why it hurts so much. Um, but what she did is, is she, she pushed pause, and I love this. She went to find someone to give her perspective. In this case, it happened to be someone who works in soul care where she just went and talked to this person to say, like, help me think through this. And, and I love that. Like, I don't think, like, in, in one sense, old school Kevin would have been annoyed that, like, two people are talking about me and I'm not there. That, that, honestly, that ticks me off. Like, I don't like that. But I respect it because she needed perspective to see, like, what her feelings were. And so we finally said, I said, do you have time to talk? And when we had time to talk, she she, you handled it so gracefully. Like, she really said, like, you don't owe me an apology. And me, because I want things smooth in my life, I'm, like, apologizing, like, 25 times in three different languages at the beginning of the conversation, you know? Like, I'm texting. So, and she's like, don't. Like, it's not about that. Like, she, she real, Angela, in this case, realized, like, I'm hurt because of the stuff in my life, not because of you. And, and I still did apologize because I never want someone I'm working with or, or that matters to you know, to feel offended. And, and she was so graceful. I, it still touches me that you, you know, you, you owned it and you said, no. In fact, like, this, this annoyed me too right now because when we decided to talk about this, Angela almost said, I'm, I'm outing you here, so I'm sorry. She almost said, I don't want to get up there and talk about it because I'm, I'm worried someone's going to look at this and be like, what a dumb girl to be offended by that. And, and we chuckle on one hand, but we do that all the time. Like, we legislate people's offense. Like, you get mad at me, and the first thing in my head is not, you're hurt. The first thing is, well, why are you mad about that? And it doesn't matter. If someone in your circle is hurt, that trumps everything. And, and so the fact that she could get up here and, and, again, both of us be able to kind of make ourselves not look great in this conversation to say, like, no, it matters because if anyone, if any single person in your circle is hurting, that matters way more than why, how, or what they should have done. And, and so at the end of the day, okay, you can only do what you can do. I can't be responsible for anyone else's action. And unfortunately, that leads us to like one of the F words. And it usually has to do with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice, and it's unilateral. Um, Angela, in this case, chose to forgive me, okay? No matter what I did, she still made that choice. I think I made it easier. Like, I, I mean, I didn't, I got a little defensive. <laughs> I, I, I tend to do that. Like, if, if you tell me you're, you know, offended, I am feeling sorry for you, but I'm also a little defensive. Um, but, but I was aware that it was an internal thing that was affect, which is why I think assessing, stopping and thinking, why am I hurt? And me realizing, oh, this is not because of Kevin, this is because of what happened in the past, because of what I experienced and talking to someone about it. Um, was a I was able to have that conversation with you where you did get defensive, but I, I found my, I didn't get offensive because you, for me, it was in a sense you were right to be because you didn't do anything wrong. I was just trying to figure out my stuff. So I think having that conversation was very helpful because we were both able to see each other's perspective. Yeah. She was very good at this. Um, we were talking, there was another student in the youth group who, uh, he, he was upset about something. And I was right in, this, in the exchange. Like, I, I, I was right. He was wrong. And, and I'm ex we're talking this through as leaders, and, uh, and she said, you just need to listen to him. Like, you just need to try to understand. And I was too, I'm too busy most times trying to be right or trying to tell you why you're wrong to just listen, that this is a hurt kid, a hurt young woman, a hurt me. And um, sometimes it's that simple. Like, we spend so much time 
trying to be understood. Like in this exchange, like if we're talking and we're disagreeing, I'm trying to, have, I want to be understood. She wants to be understood. It doesn't get anywhere. The idea is like, just listen, just try to understand people. So let's make it all about you in a good way. Go back to the circle. Jesus has a great way of making it about you. Any situation you throw out, it comes down to you and what you choose to do. It comes down to me and what I choose to do. If it's an enemy, it's that Matthew 5. What does he say to me? He says, Kevin, love your enemy. Okay? If my brother sins against me, if Angela sins against me, he tells me what to do. He says, you go to her, Kevin, and you tell her. Well, what if I sin against her? Matthew 5 again. If I did something wrong, I go to her. Okay? What do I do? I need to live at peace with everybody. Okay? So many times we're like, what Rudy should do, or what Maria needs to do, or what Kendra needs to do. Jesus makes it pretty simple. He says, you. And again, if we were all playing the same game of Uno, this would work. Because you'd be doing it, and I'd be doing it, and we can. The problem is we don't. Like, everybody's playing their own house rules. And, and well, if you did me wrong, you got to come to me. It's not what he says. And so, a reminder that the enemy of your soul seeks to cancel you. And he uses offense. He wants to cancel your purpose. He wants to cancel your destiny. He wants to cancel your relationships. He wants to cancel your anointing. Everything you're going to do, he wants to cancel, and he uses offense to do it. And some of us let that happen. I, I do, okay? You know who invented cancel culture? You know who invented it? Jesus. Like, the ultimate cancel culture was the cross. When, when they're doing the worst things imaginable to him, when they're doing the betrayal, the insults, like, you add up everything in that chart, they did. And yet, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Like, and, and it canceled the power that the devil can have. It canceled the power that offense and hurt can have. And so, here's my closing story. Amy will appreciate this as a teacher. My third grade teacher, Miss Haverica, shout out. Um, she had story time, and she read us this book. I grew up in Vermont, so it was a book that had hunting in it, because that's what they do in Vermont, uh, Where the Red Fern Grows. And it's about this boy who goes hunting. And in that book, uh, they needed to trap a raccoon. So they described this trap that I never really understood, so she had to find a picture of it for us to get it. And you take, you drill a hole, and you put something valuable in the hole, and then you hammer these nails in. So the raccoon can reach his hand into the hole. And then he grabs the thing, his little paw, but because his hand is full, he can't pull it out. And this seems odd, I feel like animals are smart, but raccoons will not let go. They will hold on to it to the point where they either die or the hunter comes because they're holding on to that thing. And um, for you animal lovers, PETA, uh, they have outlawed this trap, so it's, it's no longer you know, allowed to be used. But, but this idea is powerful. Like the raccoon, all he has to do is let go of that thing and he can pull his paw back out. And, and that's, that, that's a fence. Like you can choose to hold on to it and you're going to be stuck. You're going to stay stuck. And the enemy of your soul is going to be able to cancel all the good stuff that God wants to do. You know, and if you can let it go in a healthy way, like if you can let it go in a way that like is healthy and meaningful, then you can get out of that. And so um, I want to land the plane and get you out of here. I talk longer than I wanted to. I'm so sorry. Um, Sit up if you would. If, you, if you're one of those people you want to stand, stand. But just adjust yourself. Put both feet on the ground for me. This works better without masks. But take a deep breath in and then let it out. And I'm going to pray. Um, whenever we encounter God's word, it, 
it merits a response. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk us through three stops on the way out the door here. So close your eyes with me as we pray. Father in heaven, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take your finger right now and place it on the souls of everyone listening. Oh, Holy Spirit. And we're going to make this first stop at the cross. And as you sit there, I just want you to run in your head all the things God has forgiven you for. All the things we've done, said, thought, left undone that he says, I forgive you for. If that makes you grateful, if that makes you sad, if that makes you joyful, just let it flow. But we stop at the cross and we just say, thank you, God, that you forgive. Now we're going to make a second stop. So step with me. So the second stop is on your contact list. Whether you're old school and you have a Rolodex or you have a phone contact list, I want you to just scroll down that contact list in your head. And I want you to land on anybody that you're still mad at. Anybody in that list that has hurt you or upset you that you still think about. Anyone on that list that if they called right now, you'd get that pit in your stomach. And I want God, Holy Spirit, Father, can you show us those names as they pop up? And for each name, Father, help us decide if we're going to hold on or let go. And the last stop is in the mirror. So we stand before a mirror and we say, uh, God, who have I offended? Who have I hurt? Whether I meant to or not, whether I think they should feel hurt or not, if there's anyone in my circle that I've hurt, can you show me? Can you give me the courage to do the soul work and maybe have a conversation? So Heavenly Father, as we, as we stand here, sit here, as we are here today, we realize we don't always get this one right, but uh, can you make us, God, the kind of people who listen, the kind of people who try to understand rather than be understood, the kind of people who care when someone in our life is hurting, the kind of people who don't legislate it or question it, but just say, I'm sorry. Learn how to do a good apology. Show us how to be the kind of people that can let go of things in a healthy way, that can embrace forgiveness, and that can cancel the power that the enemy has in this area of our life. So Father, as we go, go with us. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Yeah. If you need prayer, Angela's really good at this, and I just volunteered her to pray for you if you want. Um, but uh, that's all we have. Um, fortunately, fortunately, God gives us a break here, and he gives us chances. The fact that we're still each taking a breath means we have a chance to work on this. And um, if something landed today, go do something about it. If it didn't land, then 
pass it on to somebody else and maybe maybe land with them. But we love you. We miss you. Hugs. Have a great Sunday, and uh, Jesus loves you.